the arrival of the Honorable Datuk Seri Idris bin Yusuf, Minister of Higher Education. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the national anthem Negaraku. Please be seated. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera, the Honourable Datuk Seri Idris bin Yusof, Minister of Higher Education, the Honourable Datuk Maria Kancin, Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Datuk Seri Insinyur Dr Zainim bin Ujang, Secretary General Ministry of Higher Education, Datuk Professor Dr Asma Binti Ismail. Director General of Higher Education, Department of Higher Education, Datuk Professor Dr. Rosa Binti Omar, Deputy Director General of Higher Education, Private Sector, Department of Higher Education, our moderator and panelist of the day, Professor Datuk Dr. Amin bin Embi, Director Center for Teaching and Learning Technologies, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Datuk Yasmin Binti Mahmud, Chief Executive Officer Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation and Professor Dr Abdul Karim bin Alias Director Center for Development of Academic Excellence and Student Development University Science Malaysia distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen a very good morning and welcome to University of the Future seminar series rethinking teaching redesigning learning distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen to begin the forum with blessing we would like to call upon Mr Muhammad Nazirul Mubin bin Abdul Rahman to lead the doa Mr. Muhammad Nazir, please. Al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Alhamdulillah. Ar-Rahman al-Rahim. Innaka. Surat al-Ladina. Al-Rima. Al-Dalim. Amin. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولوالدينا وارحمهم كما ربونا صغارا ولأساتذنا ولجميع المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Ya Allah, with your mercy and protection, we are extremely honored to be able to gather here 
at this meaningful forum, University of the Future Seminar Series, Rethinking Teaching, Redesigning Learning. Give us your endless blessing for our ceremony today till the end of this forum. Ya Allah, the most gracious, in this fruitful forum, we humbly pray to you, Allah, the Almighty, to increase our knowledge in the concept of future education, strengthen our teaching and learning development for the betterment of higher education, and bless our efforts to maintain the spirit of the soaring upwards for the sake of Malaysia, our lovely country. Ya Allah, Ya Dhal Jalali Wal Ikram, make our gathering here a blessed one and our dispersion thereafter a guided and protected one. Make easy for us every difficult thing with your special favor and kindness, for it is easy for you to make every difficult thing easy. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana tawakina azab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaitana wa hablana min ladunka rahmah innaka anta al-wahhab. Rabbana atin wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin ya rabbil alameen. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Nazirul. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the moderator of the day, Professor Dr. Abdul Karim bin Alias, and our two panelists, Professor Datuk Dr. Amin bin Embi and Datuk Yasmin Bintin Mahmud, to be on stage and to begin the forum entitled Rethinking Teaching, Redesigning Learning. Let's give a round of applause to welcome them. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. The honorable, the honorable Minister Yang Bahagia Datuk Sri Idris Jusuf, Minister of Higher Education, distinguished guests, distinguished uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, University of the Future seminar series and uh, this is actually the third uh, seminar in the seminar series for 2016. But altogether, so far we have uh, four, uh, really four seminars in this uh, seminar uh, series. Uh, before I forget, I'd like to thank the organizer, the, mini the ministry, for uh, inviting me to be the moderator for this uh, panel discussion this morning. It's truly, uh, I'm truly honored and humbled to be here, to be among the uh, best brain in the academia and as well as from the industry. I think this uh, University for the Future, of the Future seminar series is a very good uh, effort, it's a very commendable effort from the ministry and because this uh, kind of uh, seminar series will provide an avenue uh, for the intellectual discourse on the issues of uh, higher education what are the latest trends and developments in higher education. And I think it's very, very useful, especially for the top executive management of the universities to be here, uh, so that we can listen uh, with you know, uh, our experts here to uh, elaborate and deliberate on the topic of our uh, panel discussion on our forum this morning, uh, which is the rethinking teaching and redesign learning. I think for all, for all uh, passionate educators here, including myself, is a very, very exciting and a very interesting topic. And I think it's very relevant in the context of our new um, Malaysia education uh, blueprint. And to discuss this topic uh, this morning, we have great, fantastic panelists lined up for us uh, this morning. So it gives me a great pleasure now uh, to introduce uh, our uh, panelists. So let me find their uh, biodata.
Okay, let me first uh, introduce our uh, panelists on the far right. Uh, she's a Dato Yasmin uh, Mahmoud, and currently she's a Chief Executive Officer, Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation Sendirian Berhad or MDEC. So please, yeah, welcome uh, Dato Yasmin. I have actually a very long bio data here. So to do justice, I will try to uh, highlight some of the uh, key points in the illustrial, illustrious uh, career of uh, Datu Yasmin. She started her career as an analyst programmer with local bank after graduated with a double major in computer science and mathematics. And then uh, she joined Hewlett Packard Malaysia as a general manager of commercial, channel, commercial channels organization. And she then took the dual role of general manager of Dell Malaysia and regional corporate director. Then she moved on to become the Mala Microsoft Malaysia's managing director in 2006 and became known for her Malaysianizing Microsoft mantra. And then in September 2014, she was uh, appointed as the CEO of MDEC. Uh, for those who doesn't know uh, what is MDEC, it's actually uh, a government agency as well as investment promotion agency that spearhead the digital uh, Malaysia agenda. Then she's also a board member of Bintulu Port Holdings and uh, she's very active in various uh, NGO. Uh, for example, she's a founding patron of Gorgeous Kicks, an NGO advocating women empowerment uh, with ICT. And currently, um, Dr. Datu Yasmin also has been uh, appointed as an adjunct professor to the Faculty of Computer and Mathematical Sciences at UITM and as a C in the, as one of the uh, guest speaker in the CEO faculty program of UTM. So uh, that's uh, Datuk Yasmin. And uh, our next panelist is Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Mbi from University of Kebangsaan Malaysia from UKM. And I'm very proud to be associated with Datuk Amin. Uh, we are a good friend in the circle of uh, academia, especially in e-learning. Dato Dr. Muhammad Amin Dembi is a professor of technology and enhanced learning at the Faculty of Education, uh, University of Kebangsaan Malaysia. He's a leading consultant, expert, and master trainer on e-learning in Malaysia and in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, Dato Amin is a very active um, trainer in ACAP. Um, well, he has conducted more than 200 specialized training on various topics, of course, uh, mainly on the e-learning things. And uh, she, he is very visible on the internet. If you just Google Dr. Amin, you will see he's everywhere on the internet, on YouTube, on SlideShare, and, and so on. And uh, some of his um, um, PowerPoint or SlideShare and other things on the internet has been viewed by more than 1.5 million, uh, for example, on script.com and SlideShare. And currently, Dr. Amin is a chief information officer and the Director, Center of Teaching and Learning Technologies, UKM. And uh, he is also presently the president of the Mobile Learning Association of Malaysia. He's a long string of awards and recognition. I probably will just highlight a few. He has, uh, he has received prestigious international award. Uh, recently, the most recent one in 2016, in open, as an uh, award on open education for excellent individual edu educator. educator. Um, the, Open Education of Excellence for Open MOOC Award. In fact, I think the, uh, our topic for our uh, um, panel discussion today, Rethinking Teaching and Redesign Learning, is one of, I think that's the cause that, you, uh, that won him the award. Uh, and he's also the recipient of National Academic Award, the first recipient of a, a National Academic Award in 2006 on teaching innovation. He received Muslim Outstanding Award in 2008 in education and various other recognition and awards. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very uh, expert panel in, in our panel discussion today. Once again, please uh, welcome our uh, panel. <laughs> so the, the format for our panel discussion this morning, um, I will start by giving a brief uh, background about this topic to put it in, in the perspective and the proper context. Then I will invite um, Dato Amin to give his presentation on this topic for around uh, 50 minutes. Then I will ask him a few questions to have a conversation. 
then I will invite Dr. Yasmin to give her reaction, to give her feedback and comments on the topic from the industrial, uh, from the industry perspective. So let me start um, the ball rolling by putting things into the context. This th this topic: rethinking, teaching, redesign, learning. I'd like to start with this. Uh, I quote this from the interview um, by Times Magazine in 2006. Six years into the millennium, they interviewed uh, Bill Gates, and this is what he said in that article. In almost every area of human endeavor, the practice improves over time, but that hasn't been the case for teaching. So basically what he was saying is, you know, if we have a doctor from 18th century, he get a new life and come back in the 21st century, Maybe he, the doctor won't be able to practice because of the advancement in the medical technology, and maybe he, he, he couldn't actually uh, practice in the 21st century. That's how much things have changed in the medical area in, in, in some other uh, areas. But if you have a teacher from the 18th century and come back in the 21st century, maybe he can still do his practice. He can still he can go to any classroom and he still remain and he's still the same as what he has done the 18th century. So that's what basically uh, Bill Gates said. Okay, next. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think I have control, I think control problem. Okay. Okay. This is a quote from um, John Landau. John Landau is actually producer of Titanic and Avata. I attended his uh, keynote speech in Las Vegas in 2012 uh, on, in one of the biggest educational uh, technology expo. And he's the first keynote speaker. And this is what he said. Educators in the 21st century are at risk of becoming irrelevant. Why did he say this? Because he was referring that to the world as a global classroom. Because now, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, huh. This is technology. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because he was referring the world as a global classroom. Not only the classroom as we know, you know, the physical classroom, but now we have the internet as a huge repository of information and knowledge. So the students can go to the internet and can get the content uh, from the internet. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Well, the government around the world, globally, are looking at raising the standard of education. Everyone want, uh, you know, want to produce the world-class uh, students. But then, we are still uh, uh, struggling you know, with the concept of 21st century education. So the ministry, I think, has taken a very good uh, effort to launch this Malaysia Education Blueprint Higher Education 2015-2025. We have 10 shift, and shift number one is basically about the student, the graduate, the talent that we want to produce from our universities. So shift number one is about holistic, entrepreneurial, and balanced graduate. So with this as a background to put this title into the perspective and into the context, I think uh, we now have um, the panelists now to, de to deliberate on this point. So uh, I would like to now invite our first uh, panelist, Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Mbi, to deliver his uh, presentation to deliberate on this point uh, about uh, 15 minutes. Eh? Silakan, Ibu. Oh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Yang berhormat uh, Datuk Seri uh, Idris, yang berhormat uh, Timbalan Menteri, Pengajian Tinggi, uh, Datuk KSU, Datuk KPT, Datuk Asma, uh, VCs, BVCs, Prof Karim, uh, Datuk Yasmin. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, sh to share um, my little idea of rethinking teaching, redesigning learning. I would like to begin the presentation with a short one minute video clip I found a few years ago, but I thought it's relevant to today's. Uh, workshop series, Future of Universities, and it will, in a way, cover some of my thoughts. So I would like to uh, 
If you can, please pay attention to two things. One, the chair, it has certain symbolism. And secondly, when the, when the narrator says, where is it written, dot, dot, dot. Can we have the sound, please? Where is it written that the old way is the right way? Where is it written that a traditional education is the only way to get an education? Where is it written that classes only take place in a classroom? What if you could get your degree to develop your talent, no matter who you are or where you are? What if there was a different kind of university? One that's changing the rules, that comes to you, that fits in your life, even adapts to how you learn. Where is it written that you can't change your life? That's just the thing. It isn't written anywhere. This is actually, I, I thought, you know, a very short, but, you know, it has a, a, a nice message eh, by uni a university. But I like the term, where is it written? You know, is it written that, you know, we have to do things the, the old way or... So I'm going to deliver it on that. Uh, this is actually, uh, this idea of rethinking teaching and re redesigning learning has been in my mind for actually quite a number of years. Uh, but I'm happy that I'm able to um, offer this as an profes online professional development course, uh, as a MOOC. When MOOC came into, into the discussion, I was a bit skeptical. But uh, after launching the MOOC, I think the MOOC has sort of transformed me also. I am a strong believer now in online learning. I used to, I used to think that you know, blended is the way to go. But I think we can do, we can do more with, with fully online learning. Um, so basically, uh, the idea of rethinking teaching, redesigning learning was coined about a year ago. I was invited to deliver a keynote at uh, the Global Education Forum in Dubai. By the way, they pay you quite, quite, you know. Then you know what you're worth for. You see, I, I do a lot of sharing to the world for free, you know. So people ask me, what do you get, you know, by when you give things for free? But actually, this is a new marketing strategy, I think, for academicians. So three years back, I got a, an email from Saudi. They say, can you give a half an hour talk with a negotiable, Honorarium, so I thought, oh, this is great. So the next day I got an email, they say, we're going to pay you 10,000 USD. Is that okay? <laughs> then I say, wow, am I worth that much? You know, here if you, if you, if you deliver a, a one-hour talk, you know, you get only 300 as a professor. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, anyway, <clears throat> I was asked to talk about the DNA of the 21st century educators. So I thought, now let's go back to the uh, protein base of DNA. I'm sure we all know this, okay? The A, T, C, G. I'm from, by the way, I'm from the social sciences, but you know, I, 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 I do remember. So I thought, wow, maybe, maybe I, can, I can look into this uh, DNA. And then, you know, so, so to me, these are the four traits of 21st century educator. And I agree with the quote that Prof. Karim uh, quoted just now, that I think lecturers are at risk, professors are at risk of being irrelevant if they do not rethink teaching and redesign learning. So these are the four things, so I, I will elaborate more. I think first and foremost is all of us we need to really be aware of the, the generation that we are facing nowadays. So we need to be aware of the attributes of the learners and their learning. I think our, our focus has so much been on teaching and you know, how to deliver our content. It's, it's so much about us lecturers. So that's number one. Number two, I, I think teaching in university needs to be transformed. That's, that's for sure. Uh, it's no more lip services. Uh, in fact, you know, um, 
I personally do not believe in lecturing. That's my take, you know. I'm going to go into that in a moment. And in UKM, you know, I, you know, in front of my uh, vice chancellor, you know, I, we, we're going to try something new uh, this semester. We're going to try Minggu Bebas Kuliah. No lecture. We're going to lock all the lecture rooms. So that lecturers can now you know, think of ways, can people learn without a lecture? So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about that. C is to centralize the curriculum, and I will elaborate on that. And G is to go green, to go digital, and go global. Is this true? Or is this a symbolism, or is this something true, you think? I think the message is right. What about this? We are facing a generation, a new generation, called Gen Z. Gen Z, not Gen Y. Many people think, you know, we are now facing Gen Y. Eh? I think beginning last cohort, Gen Z is already in our system. So I, if you want to remain relevant, we need to understand them. We need to understand how they learn. Okay? So Gen Z are those who are born from mid 90s till 2010, so now they are about what? Six, uh, 20, no, 16. They're in our system already since last cohort. Eh? Okay. Now, when we talk about Gen Z, we need to, to understand that uh, technology is innate. They are born with technology. My granddaughter and grandson will take one year old, they will know how to operate the smartphone. Okay? We call them the eight seconds generation. So every eight seconds they will either go on the right hand side, every eight seconds they will go down. They are, they are always connected and technology is innate. So I, I think it's, it's, it's very important that we understand them. Otherwise, they will be in our classroom. We will be teaching. We will be lecturing. But our students will be what I call disconnected. They're there because they have, they, they, they have to be there. How do you know they're connected? The moment they look at their smartphone. You know? And in their hearts, they say, Bila orang tua nak habis ni? You know? When is this old man going to finish his or her lecture? Okay? Because, you see, this generation, they crowdsource. They, they crowdsource. Maybe, uh, let me share a bit. Eh? Recently, I went to Poland to receive the award. So, I took, my, I took my family with me. I've got two Gen Z in my family. So, I contacted the travel agent. The travel agent says, it's going to cost at least 15000 per person for the ground arrangement, not including the ticket. So my sons and daughters says, don't use a travel agent. No, we, we will be your travel agent. We will do everything. So my heart like, you know, we're going to Eastern Europe. We went to six countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech, Slovakia. You know, so I was saying, you know, safety is the most important. But my daughter, who is 21 now, she, you know, went to the uh, internet and did all the research and do all the bookings. And I was, you know, reflecting on the process that, you know, how is it that they're able to rely on uh, strangers? Okay? When people come to the class, to our class, they've got experts in front of them. But our generation today, they're willing even to trust strangers. That's how, that's how they learn. And by the way, there's something called Kyuto Gaji. When I, when I studied education, we learn about pedagogy. Okay, pedagogy is the art to, to, to assist children to learn. And then after a few years, we were introduced with andragogy, how adults learn. There's a new knowledge called 
Hutogoji. I'm not sure whether I got the spelling right. Hutogoji or Huta Goji. It is self-determined learning. And I think our Gen Z is that. So what happened? She did all the uh, research and said, now I want your credit card. I need to do the booking. Like I'm 50-50, you know, is this going to work or not? No? So in the end, what happened? She managed, she did all the, the, uh, the booking for us. She got the best homestay, the value for money, and, you know, the, the actual cost is only 7,000. We only pay 7,000 ringgit for the whole journey, each one of us. So I said, wow, this is interesting. How is it that a 21-year-old girl, by the way, she memorizes Quran. She's now in the queue. You know, she's not like from the sciences and so forth. And my son said, we will be your tours, uh, no, tour guide. Okay. So we rented, no, so they did everything. We rented the car. Uh, then we were traveling from one city to the other. Being from the baby boomer, Okay, I was so uh, anxious, uh, worried. So one day we were traveling. Uh, you know, to travel we use the smart smart card, you know, the telephone. So when we were out, when we were the outskirts at the uh, you know of the city, you know, we were not able to access the internet, and I was so worried. How are we going to find our next homestay? So my my twenty old year son says, "No worry." They call me Walid uh, in Arabic. I mean, I've got some Arabic. You can see from my uh, blood. Eh? So, so he, what he did, he downloaded the whole map of Europe to his mobile devices. So he said, no, don't worry. No, you do, we don't need internet. We can now go to places just by. So this is the 21st century. This is the Gen Z. You know, they know how to do stuff. They're very confident. And, you know, when, when I came back, I thought, wow, you know, perhaps I, I, we need to revisit you know, what we do in the classroom and how, how we treat them. Anyway, these are some uh, cartoons to, 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 to give you some idea of you know, the generation that we are uh, facing. They're on cloud now. Some people are very worried that students are Googling. I, I'm not worried. No, let me, let me ask you something. When you bump into a new term, what do you do? Being a baby boomer, what do you do if you bump into a term? What do you do? You Google, because Google can give answers. And why are we so worried that our, our generation today, some, I was at a workshop uh, on Saturday, so some lecturers say, no, you know, our generation, they say they Google and they cut and, and they cut and paste. I say, you know, I mean, that's how, that's how we, that's how I learn today, you know. I mean, when we want to know something, I mean, this morning we, we Google and we wanted to find somebody. The moment we saw the picture, oh, this is the so and so. So if we also get information from the Google, is there anything wrong if the, you know, our generation is getting? So I think it's not what they Google, but how they Google, how they select the information that's important, eh? Yeah. What do we worry? Appointments. What do our Gen Z worry about? How many likes, how many tweets, and so forth. Eh? Today's generation gap by the numbers. Okay. Maybe this video will give us uh, a glimpse of the generation that we're facing today. Do you recognize me? Very soon, I will be your student. But I will not always sit in your classroom. I will not take out a pencil or open a textbook. You grew up with books. I read from a laptop, an iPad, a smartphone. I use a keyboard more than a pen. I'm a digital native, an active learner. Why carry just a textbook when my iPad connects me to the world? I want to know things all the time and right away. Maybe the best price for cool shoes or where to hike the Himalayas. 
To learn, I look online because the classroom isn't enough for me. Not when I can see faces, hear voices, and chat with people on the other side of the world. I want to learn about Chinese history from someone in Beijing. My school has to keep up with me, not the other way around. I have more and more choices. When you were my age, no one had heard of a charter school. No one could imagine a virtual school. But it's projected that by 2019, half of all high school courses will take place online. I use mobile devices to connect with friends, classmates, and teachers. And when I'm more connected, I'm more interested. I don't buy music at a store or movies or books. I get them instantly online. And when they excite me, I share with friends. That's how I want my education to be. I need a degree even more than my parents. I know it, and so do my friends. But will I be prepared? Public grade schools are under huge budget pressures, and traditional college is increasingly unaffordable. I don't want crushing debt. If I can Google the best choice for cool shoes, rest assured I'll find the best choice of education, like two-year institutions and online courses where students like me have grown to be six million strong. And when I'm older, I want to keep learning. Do you recognize me? Very soon, I will be changing the world. But I need you. If you're ready to help me, I'll find you. But it's your challenge to keep up with me. I'm a digital native, an active learner. Listen to me. Help me. I think it's very important that we recognize who we are dealing with. Uh, otherwise, I think most of us teach the way we were taught. If we teach today's students the way we were taught, I think we rob them of tomorrow. I, I strongly believe in this. That, you know, I think educators, professors, we need to, we need to be relevant. I, I, I tell people that technology will not replace professors, but professors who do not embrace technology will one day be irrelevant. If, we, if a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And I think this is very important. Uh, I think in, in, in my uh, conception of rethinking, teaching, redesigning, learning, I, the, 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 the key message that I want to, to share with my colleagues is that we need to, we need to wear a new, we need, we, need, we need to take a new role. We need to wear a new cap. I'm wearing a cap all the time. Today I wear songkok, normally I wear some you know, kopia. But you see, for, for so many years, we think that we are teachers. We are the providers of knowledge, the sage on the stage. Okay? There are three ways of teaching. Teaching by telling, lecturing, spoon feeding. Teaching by showing, demonstrating. And teaching by questioning, by asking. I think we should, we should be moving from teaching by telling and spoon feeding to teaching by, by questioning, by asking, by putting the learner at the driver's seat. I'm going to talk about that more. So, so we need to understand the learners and the learning. And today's, in today's society, what is learning? Is learning just knowing? Or is it more than that? I believe that Learning is about connecting the dots. Content is everywhere. My favorite challenge to uh, most academicians, I say, why lecture? Why teach when Google has got most of the answers? Some people disagree. They say, no, no in Google, you've got rubbish. Okay, if you think so, this is a nice swimming pool. My son graduated from UITM Business Studies. Uh, from small, he has got HDD. So in, in school, he did not perform well. This is a swimming pool that he built. I need to show you the proof. People say, you know, online learning, boleh lah, you know, the theoretical part, the knowledge base, you know, with skills, attitudes, tak boleh, you know. So we wanted to build the swimming pool. We uh, called the contractor, the vendor say. Uh, at least 90,000 ringgit. So my son said, give me two weeks. So he now sat in front of the computer 
look at the various YouTube. You can learn virtually anything from YouTube. You know, YouTube, I think, is an excellent educational institution. So you can learn anything. So what he did, he did his homework. He compared you know, different ways of, uh, different systems of swimming pool. He has got no engineering background at all. The different systems, okay? So you say, okay. And we had to take the risk. I mean, I said, eh, betul ke ni? My, his name is Ibrahim, we call him Baim. Betul ke Baim nak buat ni? Ya, boleh. Kata, boleh, boleh, tak apa. Baim buat, Baim dah survey dah semua. You know, I did all the survey, I, you know, these are the different system. So we thought, okay, <laughs> let's try. So he did the planning, the, you know, all the, uh, the, the pump house. He knew everything from A to Z. Kalau guna ni, you see, they crowdsource. To them, you know, learning is about to learn from real people. You know, real people with real problems solving real, you know, using real solution. They don't trust very much some of these professors. They say the professor ni kadang dia teori je pandai. Okay? Huh? Oh, ah, dia kata professor ni teori je pandai. Ah, mungkin aplikasinya kurang. Okay? And and the people that they learn from are not are not experts, you know, people who wanted to self-determine people. So we've got a swimming pool there, and I'm uh, it's already two years two years now. I'm like worried maybe after one year, kalau swimming pool to collapse, ke apa kan? So he did his homework. So now <coughs> he became our uh, jack of all trades lah. CCTV, if I want, you know, he said no, give me another week. Now she, he, he puts up our CCTV. Like he's our, our in-house contractor. Lah. Uh. So my point here is that knowledge is there. So if you think that you know, people can only learn when they come to the classroom, I think we're wrong. Okay, now, my next... Uh, I think teaching needs to be transformed. So let's look at history. This is teaching, universities teaching in the, in the 60s. University teaching in the 70s. University teaching in the 90s. 21st century teaching. We have not changed at all. Remember, you, you said that, you know, that uh, in education, you know, we, 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 we believe that, you know, how can, how can there be university education without a lecture? Okay, let's look at this... Uh, Pyramid of learning. Many people, they are very surprised. You know, your students can only recall only 5% of what you lecture. So why lecture? So I tell people, you know, don't waste time. You know, you know I'm not saying that, you know, that we're not relevant. I think we need to change our role. The role now is not to Good teachers are not those who provide the correct answers. We want to be good teachers by providing correct answers. We are the expert, we are the professor, we are the PhD, so we want to teach by telling, teach by lecturing, teach by spoon feeding, teach by giving answers. But this will not result in learning. According to this, it's better to give them something to read than to to lecture. You know, people can memorize more of what they read, 10%. You may, you may move to teaching by showing, teaching by demonstrating. Still, it's very, it's, you know, it's 30%. Why? Because this is passive message, uh, passive method of teaching. So if you want to, if you want learning to take place, you need to get them, you need to put them at the driver's seat. Confucius said, I see, I forget. So if you resort to teaching by telling, your students are going to forget. That's why when you give a final exam, when you mark the paper, I always tell you know, people this joke. Somebody bump into this professor and say, Prof, what are you doing? They say, I've just finished marking my paper. So what did, uh, what did your students do? Oh, they did not do very well. Did you teach last semester? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. I taught them. Did they learn? 
<sighs> like he sighed for a moment. Did you teach? Yeah. I, teach, I taught them for 14 weeks. I used PowerPoint. I, I thought I'm one of the best professors in the university. I should be nominated for AAN maybe. But did they learn? No. They learned very little. Because, you know, classroom sessions become note-taking sessions. Do people learn by taking notes? The answer is no. If you believe that people learn by taking notes, give them the notes. People don't learn by taking notes. You know, people learn by doing. I see, I forget, I hear, I remember. So that's why teaching by showing has got some relevance. You know? But I do, I understand. If you want them to understand, if, they want to be, if you want them to become people, you need to get them to do things. And why, why should we use prime time, you know? Lecture time is the prime time. Why, why do we need to use that time to, to deliver content when content is available everywhere? So I think we need to, we need to shift from what I call the content-based teacher-centric education to the learning-based learner-centric education. We need to transform our, our teaching and learning. Forgive me, you know, I know, you know, I respect your, but I sincerely believe that, you know, please stop lecturing. Do something else. Use the lecture time to engage your students. You know, lecture, listening to lecturing are lots. We call lower order thinking skills. So use class time, use lecture times to do HOTS, higher order thinking skills. Eh? Okay, I've got 20 minutes left. Okay, in my training, I normally ask uh, lecturers, professors to share their conception of teaching. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you to think for a while. What's your conception of teaching? Okay, if in your mind, you have got keywords like teaching is about sharing knowledge. Teaching is about disseminating knowledge. Teaching is about transferring knowledge. Teaching is about, you know, transmitting knowledge. You're from the old school. You're from the old school of, you know, conceptualizing teaching. You know, you think that, you know, my role, we've got people who are here to learn, so my role is to share the knowledge, to deliver the knowledge, to transfer the knowledge, you know. So you're from the old school of thought. Your concern is about me delivering the content. But if in your mind just now, you have keywords like teaching is about to inspire, teaching is about to ignite the love for learning, teaching is about to mold the learner, teaching is about uh, to build the character, to motivate. That's the new conception of learning. That's the modernist approach to teaching. Sorry. Yeah. It's not about you and the content. It's about the learner and what you, want to, what you want them to be. That's the new conception of teaching. Eh? That's why they say great teachers inspires. Great teachers inspires. And I'm sure we can remember a few teachers, right from our primary school teachers who inspires us. Eh? These are some quotes uh, in my course uh, in Rethinking Teaching and Resigning Learning. I get people to share quotes about uh, teaching. And I like, this is one of my favorite. The best teachers are those who show you where to look but don't tell you what to see. We are so focused about the what, about the content. Eh? I, I believe there's so more what's that we can ask them. I'm going to come to that in a moment. So good teaching is more about giving the right questions than giving the right answers. Uh, so don't, don't worry, you know, that you know, my role is to, to spoon feed everything. And, and I think the, what is uh, the most uh, that really struck me, you know, I, I'm sad that higher education has been this, we come to class, we walk through our PowerPoint, we spoon-feed our, our students, and during exam, 
we give them questions. The students now will vomit what we spoon fed them. You know, when you see vomit, what do you do? You go, and but when the students can can you know say exactly like our PowerPoint, we say, oh, this is good, lah. No, no, I, I, so pity I have to give him because he was able to to you know recap what I said during class or what what was in the text, textbook. That is not higher education. Higher education is not just to memorize facts. Higher education should be more than that. It's not what they do. It's not what they know. It's what they what they do with what they know. Huh? So I think I think seriously, Datuk Sri, we need a champion for an, an alternative form of assessment. The assessment is also a culprit. In our system, we are so much into exam oriented, and our exams are actually you know, driving our practice. So students will ask you, Prof, is this in the exam? Prof, is this in the final exam? All right. Okay, this is my third point. We need to centralize the learning. I like to, to use the word, you know, I think that our curriculum cannot be static. Our curriculum should be an organic curriculum. Why is, this, why is that so? Because knowledge is changing very fast. When I did my degree, I learned pedagogy. When I trained my, my trainees, I taught them pedagogy and andragogy. But if today's lecturers do not talk about hitogogy, you know, you're behind time. If you teach marketing, you don't talk about Facebook. You don't talk about Twitter. You don't talk about WhatsApp. Okay? Five years back, people, people, you know, talk about Friendster. But Friendster is no more relevant. Okay? So knowledge is changing. So how can our curriculum be static? So I think the curriculum has to evolve. Our problem is that it should be organic in nature. It's not one size fits all, one size fits none. You know, we have to personalize the learning. Eh? Now, I like to, to, to spend some time on this. When we design our curriculum, our approach is what we call just in case. Give them 120 credits just in case they need it. So we give them as much as possible. Do that. Uh, but upon graduation, many of the things that we give them are sort of not relevant. Uh, the way to go is to go into just in time. You know, now they're in the market, you know, now they're in the industry, there's a lot of new things. Eh? So learning should be just in time. With the younger generation, it should be just enough. Uh, Prof Karim like to use the word uh, bite-sized learning. It's called micro-learning. You give them bits and pieces. And our lecture is, is too long because our student span of attention has dropped from 20 minutes to 10 minutes. Today, I think the average span of attention is about three minutes. I do training how to uh, create videos. So when I tell uh, lecturers, my, my trainees, that when you teach, when you create teaching videos, your video should be not, should be not more than 10 minutes, if possible, three minutes. Then everybody go, huh? Macam mana, Prof? I normally teach for one hour. And you're asking me to create a three minutes video? Yeah, I say it, it's, it is up to your philosophy. If you want to spit, if you want to spoon feed, then you need one hour. But if you just want to entice them, if you, if you want them to, you know, if you want to put them at the driver's seat to have motivation to, to learn, you need just a three minutes video to get them thinking to that get them going and so forth. Eh? So just in time, just enough, just for me. Uh, students, in fact, all of us, we have got different cognitive learning styles. So the information needs to be given in, in, in various formats. And our generation now has become a very visual generation. That's why now people go into informatics, sorry, infographics. Uh, and that's why, you know, good content is animated content. Okay, uh, this is actually from Charles Jennings. In fact, uh, when we, I think there was a newspaper cutting by Dan, was Daniel. Daniel wrote, yeah, Daniel wrote uh, an article about this. 
I, I gave a talk at UNITA. So Professor Charles Denning, you know, he tweeted from Europe saying, wow, Malaysia has changed. Education in Malaysia has you know, been transformed. Okay, according to his model, what we are, who we are, 70% is from experience. 20% is from our social uh, networking. And only 10% what we are, who we are, is actually from our formal learning. And I'm the walking, you know, I'm, I'm walking the talk. Okay? My background is applied linguistic. But how is it, you know, in the Asia-Pacific region in Malaysia, people say, you know, Prof. Amin is an e-learning expert. I don't, have, I don't have any background on e-learning, on technology. I'm just a, a, an applied linguist. But, you know, I learn from experience. I, I, I'm thankful to YouTubers. Uh, my YouTubers are my guru. I learn from them. So what we are saying here is not we should not have classes. I think the message here is that I think if there's only one message you can take home from this uh, session, my talk is we need to now wear a new cap. We have a, a new role. The role is not merely a teacher delivering content. I think our role is to become learning, meaningful learning experience designers. We need professors to have the mindset of the learner. Or we can call, let's, let's call, don't call ourselves lecturers, let's call ourselves learning architects, learning engineers. So a professor should be thinking, what sort of learning experience can I provide to my students so that the learning is meaningful? Saya kena jeling-jeling tengok my time. Okay. Okay. I think learning should be learning by doing, learning by exploring, and learning by providing space to our students. So I've got three short videos. Maybe I'll play only two. This is the story between me and my children. And the bus. Now I can't read the book. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it like this. ฉันรู้แค่ว่าต้องทำให้ดูให้เขาเห็นเป็นตัวอย่างพอเห็นเขาได้สังเกตได้ลองทำเองวันนี้ฉันสบายใจแล้วที่เห็นเขาทำได้แบบนี
และมั่นใจว่าวันข้างหน้าถ้าไม่มีฉันเขาจะยืนได้ด้วยตัวเขาเอง I've got two other videos, but I'm not, not going to play. One is called "We Can Try." So if you have time, please Google. And this is another wonderful, another wonderful uh, video called "The Class of Rowdies." You must watch this. We don't have time. Class of Rowdies. Just Google and huh? show it. Okay. Today is my first day, and I will be taking all your science subjects. So let's start off on a good note. <laughs> So let's start with a nice round of introductions. My name is Sakshi, and I love working with young people. Ma'am, ma'am, my name is Anish. I was a topper last year. Ma'am, my IQ is 145, and I've got double promotion once. <laughs> my name is Andy. I like dancing. My name is Jason, and I like to play the guitar. Okay, everyone's done except the last roll number. Uh, Zara, where is Zara? Zara is a zombie. 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 Zara is
the end because the message at the end is very important. I just created a space where no one is judging them, where they can learn through their own interests. Hi, Good morning, So everyone is done with their session except Zara. Zara, come on. Zara, Zara. is a voice, waiting to be heard, wanting to be understood, wishing to be loved. Thank you, ma'am, for listening to us. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for finding the reason for our rowdiness, for giving a channel to our craziness. Thank you, ma'am, for finding the poet in a zombie, and for setting me free, for letting me be. Okay. I think, I think this is important for the younger generation. We need to give them the stage. We have for so long taken the stage. We need to give them the space to, to, to do more. Eh? Okay, I'm going to uh, skip some of my slides because I've got the final. We need to move from the what, the so what, the now what, and the then what. I think we have focused so much on the what. When I chair a PhD session, I will ask the PhD candidate, so what? If the PhD candidate cannot answer, then to me, you know, you, you don't deserve to get. It's not what you, it's what you do. It's not what you know, but what can you do with it, what you know? Now what? Then what? Are you going to stay with this formula for the rest of, you know, 500 years that we have? Then what, you know? Can we come up? I think we need, we need to give them space to, to be creative. And I think flipping the classroom is the way to go. You know, instead of spending class time teaching, we do this uh, training, I think Prof. Uh, Karim is a champion of flip classroom. So let's, let's lecturers record their, their, their teaching, give them before students come to class and use class time to engage them in meaningful learning. I coined this system flip learning 3.0. It's not anywhere in the internet. Because to me, flip learning 1.0 is still spoon feeding, but you spoon feed them before they come to class. Flip learning 2.0 is to become smart. Instead of creating content, you curate content. You, you make use of existing open education resource. But to me, Flip Learning 3.0 is to give no content at all. Put them at the driver's seat. I practice this, task-based learning. Every week, I give my students tasks. The idea is that when they complete the task, learning will take place. Okay, of course, you know, with the younger generation, you need to make the learning interesting. I know this is Datuk Sri Punya Forte. Gamification, huh? you, should, you should try using Kahoot in your classes. Get your lecturers, professors to use Kahoot. You know, it's a game that you can uh, use in the classroom. And finally, to go digital, to go green, you know, go blended. And this is the way to go. Okay? Bite-sized learning, micro-learning. You give them bits and pieces. Get them hungry to come back and want more. I think good professors or facilitators, facilitators were able to create that thirst for knowledge, wanting to come back and know more. Okay, and embrace social media. In fact, you know, I, I, uh, many universities are using LMS. To me, LMS is out of date. You know, I did a, a nationwide survey. 95% of our students are on Facebook. Use Facebook for teaching. You know, why, why, why use LMS and no one is there? There's no sense of ownership. No, use WhatsApp because everybody is on WhatsApp. Eh? So embrace social media. And there are ways to create quick content. And, you know, in the classroom, practice bring your own device. Uh, we do this a lot, you know. I think people are complaining. When I go uh, in trainings, people say, you know, the internet is not. I say, you know, 
get them, get them to take out their smartphones and interact with them with the smartphones. You know, that's the way to go. Okay, finally, go global and we are on the right track. You know, we should open up our classrooms and, you know, MOOC is the way forward. Uh, I, I uh, started this MOOC and my MOOC is a bit different. I've got 2,700 uh, participants, mainly, mainly professors, teachers, educators from 95 countries as of this morning. And there's no teaching at all from me. The only, the only me that you will see is the cartoon. The three minutes cartoon, that is the only thing that you will see. The rest are, I curate content. Uh, Datuk Sri was asking me, how, how do you do? But people find that my, my MOOC is one of the best MOOC they have taken before. So if the design is right, if the design is right, learning will take place. Eh? Okay, just one, uh, I will stop at this one last slide. Okay? Uh, people believe that learning on the online can only be for the, for the knowledge-based, theoretical base. My rethinking, teaching, redesigning, learning has got two, two parts. Module 1 to 6 is what I call minds-on. Module 7 to 12 is hands-on. But I don't interact at all. With, I mean, we don't meet at all. If you read some of these reviews by these teachers, uh, by, by the way, Mohamed Adli is from, is from uh, uh, Mauritius. Michael Park is from Canada. Okay. If you read the reviews, what I'm trying to say is that I was surprised that, you know, it's, it's possible for me to change mindset of educators around the world via a MOOC. If you say that, you know, uh, you know, Values mana boleh, mindset mana boleh change, skills mana boleh. Eh? But if you have time, I would like to request all VCs, you know, if you uh, please share this course with uh, your lecturers. It's called Rethinking Teaching, Redesigning Learning, available on Open Learning. It's meant, you know, to get people to rethink teaching and to redesign learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amin. I think Dr. Amin has uh, shared with uh, with us a lot of important points uh, on this uh, rethinking teaching and redesign learning. But to me, the way I see it is about making a total makeover of our classroom. In fact, the whole, um, you know, when we look at teaching and learning, it's only one element or one component in the whole academic ecosystem. And, you know, there are other things, other elements in the in the academic ecosystem. So this is what uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Amin, you know, in the context of rethinking, rethinking teaching and redesign learning, you know, what, what do you think are the overriding uh, challenges or the key issues, the key challenges if we, if we really want to transform the way we teach and the way students learn? Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, I agree with you that you know, we have to look at the whole ecosystem including the, our appraisal system. I think at the, uh, in our universities, I, I'm sure our VCs are here, when you get somebody to be there for the associate professor, professor, we assume that you know, as far as teaching and learning is concerned, it's more on summer. We don't differentiate people on their teaching and learning. We only uh, give, I think we give too much emphasis on research and publication, which is important. But we cannot assume that, you know, candidate A, candidate B, candidate C is equal in teaching. I think we need, as much as we, we are very detailed in our uh, appraisal of, you know, re with regards to research and, and uh, publication, we need to do that. My deputy vice chancellor once, I think, uh, interviewed some uh, potential professors and asked a question. Did you, uh, did, do you have a MOOC? Say no, no, no. You see, the next week I got like suddenly my workshop on MOOC. Normally we have like fifteen. Then suddenly I got like thirty participants. I was so surprised. I said, "What happened?" You see, now in the interview they ask you whether you are, you're offering a MOOC or what. You see the effect of. So imagine now if you go for Kenai Pangkat, you ask him, you know, what do you know about rethinking, teaching, designing? What do you know about blended learning? How do you blend your classroom? You know? So I think. The appraisal system must be geared towards teaching. At the moment, we, we treat people equally. And, and perhaps another, another uh, the, the greatest challenge to me is the mindset. Lah. The mindset. To change the mindset. 
Dia kata, I, you know, you know, you nampak tu. Yang tun tu, itu my student lah tu. You know, I mengajar lecture je. Kan? Uh, people think that, you know, uh, uh, that the, the old way, the traditional way is the correct way. Uh, where is it written that the old way is the right way? So I think changing the mindset is important. So therefore, you know, we, do, we need to do training. And probably another thing that I think the, the country should be looking at is assessment. We need a champion to come uh, to say, here's alternative assessment. And one, I think, assessment that we should be looking at is portfolio assessment. It's what they do, not what they know, but what they do, what they create. If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy, very little we pay attention on the... The, the, the creating part. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amen. Right, uh, before I invite uh, Dr. Yasmin to give her response and maybe comments on uh, Dr. Amin's uh, presentation just now, maybe Dr. Uh, Yasmin, I just read some facts because you are from MTech, you know, the technology side. Um, I found this uh, statistic, this latest statistic on the uh, usage of internet, the ownership of mobile devices uh, among Malaysians. Very interesting facts. Let me read. Yeah? Malaysians spend on average 4.6 hours a day using the internet through desktop or laptop computers and 3.6 hours a day accessing the internet on mobile devices. And... Um, 96% Malaysian have mobile devices of all types. 71% have a smartphone. 35% have a laptop and desktop. 14% have a tablet device. And I think Malaysia now stand at what 67% in terms of the internet uh, connectivity. So it seems that Malaysia is, you know, the world is basic. The whole world is basically wired, wired up, you know and connectivity is almost ubiquitous. But the, the question is, how do we leverage this, especially in the context of education, our educators, our students? So these are the, some of the things that maybe we, need, we have to keep uh, in mind. So maybe now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Yasmin to give your perspective on uh, what uh, Dr. Amin have shared just now. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. In about uh, 20 minutes here. Yeah? Uh, good morning. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, I do. Okay. Um, first of all, um, uh, Prof and, and Dato Amin, it was really, really fascinating what you have presented. So I was going through it over the weekend and I was saying that, okay, there's nothing to comment because I agree with everything that you say. So what I'm going to do is um, just provide the context and you did ask me to provide the context from the industry perspective. Yeah? So I want to start off by giving, you know, um, Dato, you mentioned in your last, your last point, it's about mindset change. And uh, change needs to have a compelling reason, a compelling driver for change. And I'm just wondering whether everybody is on the same pitch when it comes to the fact that the old, the future is definitely, definitely not going to be um, driven or made successful by things that have been successful in the past. And I think it's more important for me to say that because I was looking at the tweets from Datuk Sri Idris Jusso, uh, put your Twitter handle, and he was talking about why we're doing, about what, what's happening this morning. And I, there, there was a reply to your tweet, Datuk Sri, that says, what's the problem? You know? So I think the first, let me start off by saying, just giving the sense of how much the world is going to be ch changing. The world is already changing but how this is going to be even accelerated further moving forward. So for me, I've been in the industry for 30 years, and I have been through the waves of innovation. I was there when, you know, uh, Bill Gates announced the fact that he wanted a PC on every desk when the first I, I, when the first Mac was introduced by Steve Jobs, the internet boom, then the internet buzz, the internet reboom. you know. So I've been through all of that, but now we are at the cusp of something that is so explosive 
that it is never being seen before. The term that people are talking about now is fourth industrial revolution, which is going to be as impactful as the, the, the second industrial revolution, which was driven by electricity, the first driven by, by steam, you know, the power of steam. So fourth industrial revolution is about the disruptive forces of the digital innovation, which we are very familiar with already, but also you combine it, the convergence of the physical world with the digital world. So you have, um, you know, the, the, the innovation in the digital world, but if you add on the innovation in, say, biotech, Biosciences, innovation in material science, innovation in quantum physics. If you add all of these together, it's going to be explosive. Now, what we have seen are things like Uber, Airbnb, Alibaba. You know, Uber is the largest transport pro provider without owning any inventory, uh, any 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 cars or any taxi. Airbnb is the largest accommodation provider without any without owning any single hotels, and Alibaba is the largest retailer without owning any inventory. So that is already a disruptive force and Malaysia is adopting these forces. Uber, for instance, in the short 30 months that they have been in Malaysia, they have been able to recruit 160,000 drivers. And by end of this year, they'll be paying out 200 million worth of payment to these 160,000 drivers. Of course, they are disrupting the 70,000 taxi drivers, but the economic value creation, the equation is, 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 uh, you know, is, is, is in favor of the country. It's just a question of the disruptor versus the disruptee. Now, and then if you add so other things in the area of, we've heard about autonomous cars, we've heard about drones. I want to also give an example about an innovation that's happening right here on our, you know, in Malaysia. It is actually a company that is based out of UK, founded by MIT uh, uh, researchers. And the reason why I'm giving this example is because I see that it's Rike SU. He was the one who introduced this company and we've managed to bring them in as an investment. They have re relocated their R&D in Malaysia. And what they're doing is developing developing stethoscope, stethoscope that can be used remotely without, the use, without any doctor, without any, um, uh, any, any medical professional. So you just get that, uh, you know, you get that stethoscope uh, from, from home, then you download an app and it will then read, you know, the stethoscope will be then read through the app and be gone, it'll be going to a cloud application where you'll be able to use data analytics to be able to diagnose and also get access to even um, uh, concierge doctors online. You know, of course, if something's really wrong, then of course you have to go and see a, a doctor in, in, in person. Now, <clears throat> another, you know, really what's buzzing in Silicon Valley now is this company called Magic Leap. Anybody has heard of this company, Magic Leap? There are a four billion, four to five billion worth startup. Their product hasn't been in the market yet. But what they're doing is basically developing a technology that is producing digital images. I mean, you've heard about digital images that you, pro, you know, virtual reality is about, you know, uh, 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 the immersive experience and so on. But this is really, they're calling the immersive experience combined with an, what was the word they use? Acid, acid trip, hallucination. Because what they're doing is that they are, you wear the glass, a pair of glasses and this device will be able to produce digital images onto your retina. And this will make things so real that it really gives a new meaning to hallucination. You can really manage that. So, and they are the hottest, uh, the hottest startup right now. And Lucasfilm is actually already partnering with them to recreate Star Wars using this technology. So I am just... Um, giving all these examples and, and, and Malaysia, you know, we are definitely a connected society. You know, you have mentioned uh, the, the facts, Prof Karim, you've mentioned the facts just now, which is uh, Malaysia now has got internet access of 67, uh, 68%. But if you take the age group between 13 and 35, that number is 94%. So 94% of our young are already uh, connected. The Prime Minister recently has made the announcement that the country's future economic growth will have to be driven by ICT and by digital technology. 
and fourth industrial revolution is something that the Prime Minister has been talking more and more because it is real and it is, it is what's coming. Now, what, who are going to drive this? The people who are right smack in the middle of this revolution are what you call, uh, uh, I mean, is, uh, you call them uh, Gen Z. There's also the millennials. But what they are really are digital natives. These are people, you know, I like your, your graph to say that they are born with a, with a phone. The only, the, only, the only flaw in that graphic is the phone is not an iPhone. You know, so it is, should be an iPhone. There was a Blackberry, which, uh, you know. Um, so anyway, these digital natives, and I've seen these people, you know, in action. And this is uh, something that I saw personally. I saw a two-year-old, a two-year-old, I saw this in my own eyes, a two-year-old girl. She was reading a book. And she was holding the book, and she was doing that with a physical book. Because to her, why isn't the book being enlarged? Because that is her world. She's, she grew up in an iPad, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I shared this story with a friend of mine, and he says that, you know, the other day I saw my son going to a TV and doing that to the TV. So, you know, these are digital natives. These are people who don't understand anything but the digital world. And, and you know, we mentioned about the fact that they are so connected. And uh, we might even say that Malaysia, in certain dimensions, Malaysians are even more connected mm. than the global average. And I give you two facts. Number one is that in the firm of Facebook usage, yeah, we, Malaysian, is well known in the world to have the highest friends uh, linkage. So that means it is 1.6 times that of the, of the uh, global average, which means that if a Facebook user, and on the global average, one user has got 10 friends, we, Malaysians, have got 16 friends. That is how connected we are. In terms of YouTube, Usage, you know, YouTube, uh, you know, watching YouTube. We watch 80 minutes of YouTube per day, Malaysians. That is double that of the global average. So you might even say that uh, we Malaysians are even more connected and more in tune. And, and so we are digital natives, our young. Yeah, we could be, I was, I was, I was lucky enough to have uh, been uh, to have been in the industry by taking up computer science. I didn't know 30 years ago that it will lead to this kind of innovation. But then computer science was the hot thing. So my senior asked me to take on computer science in university. I said, okay lah, I take computer science. Uh, but the 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 people that that we have right now are divided into digital natives or digital migrants. You know, I think we are all, most of us, most of the non, most of the baby boomers mm -hmm. and, and below are what we call digital migrants. So, there is another phenomena that I want to just share before I go, uh, I go further. is the fact that this, uh, I mean, you mentioned about this crowdsource phenomena. About the fact that our young, they are not interested in looking for authority. Authority figure for them is it's not as important, it's becoming irrelevant because to them, everything, the truth can be crowdsourced. So if there are X number of likes, if there are X number of retweets, that is the point of validation. To me, I think it's a whole psychological phenomena which I will not try to understand, but it is the way that the, our, our young is thinking. Now, the crowdsourcing uh, phenomena uh, you know, applies to uh, knowledge, as, 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 uh, as you had mentioned, Dato, but also it is the emergence of something called the digital uh, freelance work for digital nomads. Our young, they may not be interested in coming for a job that is nine to five and here's what you do, your job scope. They have their passion, they want to work out of Starbucks. And they can go to crowdsource platforms. There are platforms such as Upwork, such as freelance.com. And the jobs are, you know, creative jobs. They are com uh, coding jobs. There are many types of jobs that you can just go and it's published. You can do a job from Germany, for instance, get paid in euro, not being in German, Germany at all. So this is, these are some of the phenomena that is, being, that, that is faced 
uh, that is faced by our millennials, and they are ready as consumers. What we have to do is the fact that for our economic creation, for social economic benefit, we have to turn our digital consumers to digital producers. And that is one of the things that I'm truly passionate about and it's becoming a very strong crusade, a very important crusade that we have to undergo, to, uh, undergo through as a, as a country. Now, it, was, it, was, it has been said that economic value creation in the world of innovation requires the young to dream the important dreams. And you have to create this society of dreamers because these are the people who want to solve the problems, who want to create value, and this is where we will be able to then become net producers of technology as opposed to now becoming a net consumer and we import our, our technology and, and, and innovation. So what do we have to do to make sure that we get our young millennials and our young to really be ready for the economic value creation that is being presented by this innovation, the digital innovation, the fourth industrial rev revolution? So first and foremost, in my opinion, is actually we have to invest in our young. And, um, you know, and, and, and to me, the young starts all the way from the schools. I've always heard a lot of professors and universities saying that, you know, by the time the kids come to our ecosystem, they, have, they only have four years. What about the, how many years? Six plus five, 11 years that has been spent in the schools. And that is why um, we are doing something really, really important with the Ministry of Education. You know that they are revamping, they are going to be uh, rolling out the new curriculum uh, k k uh, curriculum KBSR, I think, KSSR, KSSM, is going to be rolled out next, uh, next year onwards. So what we have done, it is something really important, is that we are introducing embedding coding. Now, coding has been really, you know, it's undisputedly proven and has been embraced now as not only as a means to expose people to digital innovation, but also as a means of uh, higher order thinking skills and critical thinking skills. So uh, MOE has, has, we have already piloted this uh, together with MOE and uh, the first, uh, next year is the first rollout. I think it's going to be Form 1, I think, Form 1 and Standard 3. So we are really very, very excited about this. And there's also, on top of that, there's also a whole digital maker movement that we are working with Ministry of Education to ensure that there is uh, the, the, the kids who are interested will be able to then, you know, go to their computer science club and get the help to exposure to things like uh, Arduino kits, Raspberry Pi, 3D printing, robotics, and so on and so forth. In fact, by end of this year, we hope to have competitions throughout the, 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 the country, and um, we're going to have 10 kits who will be going through an immersive trip in Silicon Valley So as a, as a, as a point of uh, inspiration for them. So I'm very excited, and, and we really need to make it work. And we have some early success stories. I'm really, really cautiously, I said cautiously optimistic about it. Um, because our early success stories, we have got standard three kids who have been exposed to Scratch programming tool and they're creating their own virtual piano. And very proud to be able to do that. We have a Form 1 group of kids who were able to use Arduino uh, uh, circuit board to, uh, to, to program using Arduino and embedding it inside their uniform and also embedding inside their backpack, school bag, so that, and they create an algorithm if there is a, 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 a very fast separation between the two, then it will trigger because this is about solving the problem of uh, uh, snatch, uh, snatch bags, yeah? And we also had this program where, you know, because the issue with us right now is that, you know, our kids, the, the good ones, they don't want to go to computer science, uh, you know, because they'd rather become a lawyer, a doctor, uh, an accountant. Um, as a result of which, we have an issue of, uh, of kids going to university who are not, uh, you know, it's only people who cannot do anything else sometimes then go into, a, go into a choose IT as a last choice, not even in the top three choice. So what we did was, we took 500, we worked the Ministry of uh, Education plus, uh, and it's just recently we, we did this, plus Mara, we took 500 of the top kids nominated by the, by, by the school, took them through a boot camp. You know, exposed them to coding, exposed them to uh, hackathons, right? So two very, and to, I mean, two very positive um, uh, uh, indicators. One, 
was the fact that the quality of work that came out of this 500 were really impressive. It, it was mind-blowing to, to some of the people, the industry people that was participating. And number two, when they came into the 500, before they came for the boot camp, we asked them a question, how many of you wants to do computer science and computer engineering in, uh, after you, in university? Less than 2%. After that boot camp, we asked the question again, more than 90% says that they now want to get into uh, computer science and computer engineering. So, and, and you know, this is, this is what we, we need to inculcate this kind of mindset change in the universe, I mean, in, the, in, in our kids. But there is one last trait that needs to be addressed in order to capitalize on this innovation. And that is about that failure is an option. And this is going to be a huge mindset change that us as a society, Malaysians especially as a society, globally too, it's an issue globally too, but I think Malaysia as a society, accepting failure. When I was in Silicon Valley and we're talking to the people there, you know, they, were, they, they always have the conversation, when they introduce themselves, I'm so and so, I am on my nth startup, I have exited how many startup, I have failed how many startup. And they are said in the same, you know, in the same tone of uh, celebratory tone. Failures and success is, 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 is accepted, uh, uh, you know, in a very natural way. Um, and and uh, in some uh, schools in, um, in uh, Silicon Valley are starting this thing called Genius Hour. It is coming from this Google, uh, Google phenomena where they, 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 they allow 20% of Google employees to be able to do something on your own. You go out there and find a problem you're passionate about. Doesn't matter how big, how small, but 20% of your time can be, can be used, office time, can be used to doing this. And schools are introducing this concept. They call it the genius hour. And they are finding phenomenal success and phenomenal inspiration by the kids in going out there to look at drains unclogging. They look at uh, green, go green. They look at simple things like traffic in front of their schools, you know. So, and this is something that is, um, that is uh, really important. How much more time do I have? Five minutes? Can I do five minutes? Five, ten minutes, okay. So, so now, from schools, I now move to um, tertiary education, yeah? Um, and, and the first, I, I, I want to share the, 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 the things that, the two dri driving force within the industry that is really uh, important. Number one is that 50% of jobs that we have now did not exist 20 years ago. These are new jobs. And number two is that because of the evolution of innovation and how fast changing it is, speed and agility and continuous learning has, has taken a whole new meaning and is taking a lot of precedence over anything else. So because of these two things, I want to share with you these two driving factors. I want to share with you what's been happening in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in the industry as, uh, in, with respect to uh, talent development. So the first one is the boot camp, boot camp concept. This is concepts where you have like nine weeks of intense, uh, intense uh, uh, capability building and what they, they, they term it ex with the objective of extreme employability. These are companies like uh, uh, Hackbright, Dev uh, Bootcamp in the US, 90% employability. And uh, this, this Bootcamp concept is, has got, is driven on three tenets. Number one is complete, complete alignment of the curriculum with the industry requirement. So if you look at this too, they do coding as well as they do web design. Yeah? And it's complete alignment. And if you think about the, you know, because, because the, 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 the technology, the, the industry requirements also changes so fast. Like right now, the, the big buzzword is around convergence. Convergence of engineering and uh, coding, computer science. A lot of our people are thinking that computer science is still a separate track and engineering a separate track. But the power is really when you combine the two. You know, and autonomous cars, drones are being developed because of the convergence of these two. In our schools, we have a student who actually created, you know, through our digital maker movement, created a vacuum cleaner that is being powered through the mobile app, through mobile phone, 
to clean bathrooms. And this has been innovated by, by our own, I think he's about 13, 14 years old. So the first tenet is about alignment with the curriculum and therefore it becomes more agile, it becomes faster. Number two is that it simulates the work env environment 100%. It's not about the classroom, it simulates the work environment. And number three is that it's, it, it's about emphasis on placement, actively placing of, of, of jobs. Now, we tried this bootcamp, com bootcamp concept in our developing of our data scientists. You know that in data scientists, of course, we talk to the universities about embedding data science curriculum, master, in postgrad, undergrad, and so on, but, you know, we, 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 we cannot wait. So, what we, we brought in this uh, model from the US uh, that was uh, piloted by this, or done by this company called Data Incubator. They are from this Cornell University ecosystem. And nine weeks, we took, you know, it was already very su successful in the US, so we, we, we put it here in Malaysia. We had 45, 45 of uh, business insights uh, uh, talent from companies in Malaysia, from the startups, as well as from Petronas, Astro, and so on, go through this nine-week program. At the end of the day, they qualified as data scientists really the hardcore data scientists that can do data, data modeling and mathematical modeling. And uh, uh, so, so this is, uh, this is uh, one of the examples of data incubator. Now, so if you look at what's, what's happening in the industry right now, you have MOOCs, yeah? You have MOOCs, and MOOCs is really already coming to a mature, to, to, to some level of maturity. It's undisputed that MOOCs is, is working, but MOOCs is for access. Now, if we also tried this model of using MOOCs for, data, for developing data professionals. And if you use Coursera MOOCs, uh, that is the John Hopkins uh, MOOCs uh, uh, course, the passing rate of, uh, of pure MOOCs, yeah, pure online uh, 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 method, is like less than 20%. So what we did was we did a blended MOOCs. And then, and I, I was doing research for this yesterday, just doing some reading, and there is a term that people are being used. It's called MOOCs is now, there is an a, a extension of MOOCs called SPOOC. You know that, right? SPOOC. Um, especially, remember, the, the one that I have here is called, um, uh, what was it called? SM yeah, I can't remember what it's called. It is called sp Specialized. Private online course. So it's actually taking the MOOCs course but putting it into a blended learning to give it higher success, right? So, you, so if you look at if you look at MOOCs, spokes, and the bootcamp concept, it really is able to address the industry's need. So what is and if you add one more uh, one more thing, one more phenomena that has been happening in the industry, it's the concept of digital badges. So you don't. You know, there's a question whether you need a degree. You know, if it's, if, it's, if it's more for the people, the parents who want to have the degree because we still have the mindset. But digital badges basically is crowdsourced validation of your skills. And if this, if you look at the three components of the MOOCs, spokes plus the bootcamp, so you have this access through MOOCs, and then you have the extreme employability through a nine-week bootcamp, and in between, you can do a little bit of spook, which is more of the customized, you know, small blended sessions. Then you combine that with a digital batch. There really is a question of relevance of the traditional university. And that is why it has been said that, digit, that, that uh, higher ed is really the ground zero for disruption. You know, if, if we talk about, if, if, if we were to ask people in the industry right now, and these are startups, yeah, what are the opportunities out there in the market in terms of being able to disrupt? The first one they will say is fintech, because the banking system is ready for disruption. There is so much inefficiency, especially when you are for digital natives. It's being built on ground from a very traditional, big bowl friendly, you know, big bowl not so friendly, right? But uh, you know, you have health tech or meditech. There's another, because that also is another, another big uh, area that is highly, uh, highly expensive. And if you look at the coming of the aging population, this is another big opportunity. And the third one, people would say, would be ed tech, education education tech, disruption in the ad tech, yeah? So I think um, 
that's all I have to say. I think I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. So my last comment would be, the case of change is undisputed as far as we are concerned. It must be. Education, the way we approach education must be changed. If Dr. Amin has not convinced it, then I think you will have to get it, to get it convinced. The second point I want to make is that the education blueprint I, I have stated this to all of, to whenever I have a chance to speak, I will say that the Malaysian Higher Education Blueprint does not have anything that does not allow all these changes to be made. It is all there. You know, I would have to quote the 2 you 2 i the, the modular TVETs, you know, things like that we are involved in. There are so many there are things that allows, that gives the framework for the change to happen. But the issue is that I am not hearing and seeing the conversations within the university, especially within the ever perennially powerful Senate, to really drive the changes. And that is a major concern for me, for MDEC, because we have to drive this digital economy. And if you don't do it well, then the country's economic growth would be impacted in not even in the long run, you know, in the, in the, in the immediate uh, future as well. So with that, uh, Prof, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was Yasmin. <clears throat> well, um, obviously, I think this, uh, the point that been, you know, repeated by Dr. Yasmin and uh, Dr. Amin, we are living in the world of constant change. And change is, is the only constant. So, Dr. Yasmin, now maybe just before I open to the floor for question and answers, maybe just uh, one question. Now, obviously, technology is part and parcel of, you know, the so-called new learning culture. So that's the reason why we have to, you know, uh, now today we are talking about redesign, rethinking teaching, redesign learning. But there's a lot of, I mean, there's so many new different technologies being introduced, you know, almost on weekly basis or daily basis. So maybe can you uh, pinpoint or highlight some of the game changes, some of the technologies that, re you know, really uh, game changes that drive this so-called new, you know, new culture of learning and also how it support the flexible uh, education of the uh, ministry. Maybe just a brief comment on that, you know, in two or three minutes. Okay, uh, Prof, I think we, we, we talked about the fact that social media, yeah, I mean, the, what we're already seeing right now, mm -hmm. social media, combi the combination of social media, mm -hmm. mobility, analytics, uh, and cloud. That is really driving whatever, and just based on, this tr on these four things, you are able to do massive, massive uh, changes and, and innovation, yeah? Then you think about what's happening in the future. You talk about 3D printing combined with 3D scanning, mm. uh, which, which, will, which will be a major uh, revolution for the world of the art design and, and even engineering. We talk a little bit about analytics, which is another huge phenomena. Data is, data is, 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 is a whole new commodity in itself. Um, and, um, and then we talked about the immersive education experience. And I think this is going to be quite a big one. The immersive, you know, I mean, uh, Dato Amin, you mentioned about the, ex the, the uh, you know, the experiential, you know, but this is about immersive because of the, the advert of uh, virtual reality with the Google Glass, you know, I mean, Google Glass and, and all these devices now are really coming down, it's driving the cost down. So you can literally just put on a, put on a glass, for instance, you know, go the Google Glasses, and um, you can even do a poll there and then. You can, you can as you are lecturing, right, and uh, you can just do a poll to say that, okay, what is, uh, what, what do you guys think? Who doesn't understand which part, for instance? And then you can be able to see, you're able to see the poll coming onto your glasses, onto, onto the Google Glass. And then you can even have, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, 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 students who may not, may be a bit shy mm. to ask questions. You can have that interact, interaction with the Google Glass. So this is just mm -hmm. giving us a, an example. And you know, if you have the magic leap we talked about, where you can have an immersive, can you imagine learning about biology, mm. you know, through an immersive experience? Immersive. I would have been a much better biology student if that <laughs> had been the case. Okay, thank you. So, we, 
we are not actually short of technology. There's so many different new technologies being introduced, uh, new innovations. Um, the only thing is how our educators actually can leverage on this uh, technology. I always use this phrase, you know. Uh, it, it's not so much of the technology, but the person behind the technology. So, you know, a fool with a tool is still a fool. So, I think it's not about uh, all about technology as uh, Prof. Uh, Dato Amin uh, mentioned just now. Okay, now I think um, um, we have uh, some time now. I would like to invite some uh, questions. I know the audience are itching to ask uh, questions, so maybe we can get the first uh, questions from the audience, please. Uh, yeah, get, get to the microphone and please introduce uh, your name and from uh, which uh, you know institution. Good morning. Uh, my, my name is Pamjit. Um, I, I must confess that this is one of the most interesting sessions I've ever attended. Yeah, it's been a pet subject of mine too. And congratulations to the organizers and the panel for such an enlightening. I kept awake all through. All right, so you had me engaged. Um, I, I want to share an example and at the same time, also perhaps make a suggestion towards the end as to what we need to do to get this moving as quickly as we should. Way back in the 90s, uh, late 90s, when our Prime Minister was the Minister of Education, I suggested to him that schools must change in their approach. And it should be, we should revamp our schools into smart schools. The inspiration of that came from what was happening in the UK during Tony Blair's time, where he put in a lot of money to revamp schools, especially in the black country. The black country is the area that's identified to be the, the, the post-industrial area that had gone down economically, uh, where there were economically deprived communities, broken families, and so forth, and the schools were, were going downhill. One of the model schools that have turned around to be one of the best schools in the UK is called Thomas Telford. When I visited the school, I looked at what they were doing in a Form 4 session in the labs. The students were producing F1 vehicles using laser prototype machines. And there were four teachers in attendance, and when I asked as to what the learning points were, they said that there were 18 learning points in that in that session, um, uh, that will culminate from that session. You know, things like acceleration, velocity, center of gravity, and so forth. All these that we were asked to memorize, the students were producing vehicles and then justifying why their vehicle was produced as they, they, they were. So that's experimental learning. That's also something they could relate not just memorize as to what velocity means or acceleration means. So that was brilliant. And at the end of the day, um, uh, on our own accord, we put a team together, uh, some from the US and some from the UK, and we came up with the blueprint privately, um, the vision for smart school education. And after having presented that to the Minister of Education, he, who was very, very impressed with what we should do, he announced it after a month. And of course, there was a lot more work done by the ministry before they did that. And three years down the road, that project, in my, in my view, failed. When I visited one of the best schools um, among the 90 pilot schools, the the, um, the deployment of technology and the way teachers were teaching had not changed. Uh, there was also um, dust covers put on computers so that they don't get dusty. They were not being used. So, of course, that was a failure. And I think that failure was perhaps change management and perhaps getting teachers excited about how this thing should be done. Just like Dr. Yasmin has just mentioned that one of the biggest battles will be to to get uh, a mindset shift in the Senate, which actually drives an entire university. Now, moving, moving forward, um, I then impressed upon my company board that we should invest in setting up a school which should become a model of a smart school. 
I'm not saying we succeeded, we failed too. Because then again, the curriculum impedes. Yeah, the curriculum impedes and at the end of the day, the final outcome that parents expect and the, the public expects and everybody expects that comes through assessment also impedes change. So this is where I think we need to relook look at um, um, things going forward as to how we can remove those impediments, how we can manage change better than we have done before, because none of this is going to become reality. The ideas are all there. There was a book written by a professor in UITM, perhaps 15 years ago, and it resonates to very closely with uh, what Datu Amin just said. You said that if you don't change, you are destroying your future, yeah? Now, she said in her book, why can't we teach children the way they were born to learn? It really means the same thing. So, even 15 years ago, we had all these things in place. So, my suggestion is that we need to, we, we need to facilitate change. Um, that Amin has also said it very rightfully that you need to be able to appraise people differently. You need to be able to appraise as to how much change people are uh, adopting. We all baby boomers. Uh, I've come through the generations the same as Datu Yasmin has. I've seen the birth of many things uh, in technology. I used to work for a British IT company which actually sold the first word processor in this country only to do word processing for 48,000 ringgit, and that was to Bukidaman. And the IGP of police had to come and cut a ribbon at that time to say, we've got a word processor. And it came with two British Airways tickets returned to London as well. That, that was technology at that time, but technology has changed, and I think you have said all the right things, and really hope that this session will will be a leverage to, to something better. The ingredients we have today, and one of the ingredients that we have is we have uh, YB Mantri, who is a visionary. Um, I know during his travels, and he comes back and he says, you know, adopt MOOCs. You know, I've never heard a single minister in the past who has been talking about technology and how it should be embraced. So YB Mantri, you should stay. Don't go to EPU. <laughs> We need you, and the country needs you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the thoughtful comment and for a big request to our YB minister. But I think probably not, that's not something for him to recite. But okay, um, maybe uh, this not this, it's not a question, but uh, it's uh, a comment, right? Uh, before I get the panel to add on to those to the point, maybe. Uh, yeah, we have someone here. Thank you. Um, my name is Pradeep from uh, Taylor's. Um, I'd like to address my question to Prof. Uh, Amin. Um, it was a fantastic presentation, and it's so nice to see um, that, that you have so much to say and I really hope there'll be more professors that um, preach the way you do. The, the, to, to me, the essence of what you presented was not so much about the use of technology, but how technology itself provides opportunity to faculty to redesign the way learning takes place. And you talked about um, the redesigning of learning uh, and the need for <coughs> mindsets to change, for assessments to change. Um, you talked about the ecosystem, the support mechanism uh, uh, that, that needs to change as well. But I, I noticed you didn't touch so much on how learning spaces uh, need to transform to facilitate the kind of um, innovative pedagogy. Would you like to comment on, on how learning spaces could further impact the, 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 the change that, that you're preaching about? Okay, thank you for bringing up. Can I answer? Yeah. yeah, bring up the matter. I once believed that you know, the physical learning space was sort of important. Uh, I think seven years back, I wrote a paper to the vice chancellor suggesting uh, various learning spaces, you know, learning spaces. Uh, 
So she, she wrote a paper, submitted to the ministry. Uh, two things happened. One, when we spoke to the uh, uh, Jabatan Pembangunan, they said, Prof, kita tak ada spec macam ni. Like, I went like, you know, they say in JKR, we don't have this kind of specs. Like, you know, yours is like, you know, ahead of time. Okay, that's number one. Number two, somehow, you know, it did not materialize. So then I said, you know, should I, should I pursue this matter? Uh, through my try and error, learning on my own, I think uh, when we talk about learning spaces, you know, you should combine three things. Technology, pedagogy, and also the physical space. You know, if you want to maximize on learning spaces. Some people, they spend so much on, you know, redesigning the physical space, but they forgot the technology. They, 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 or, or maybe they will include the technology, but they forgot the pedagogy. So I have, you know, after I, 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 that, was, that, that fail, uh, I now use uh, tools, you know, web tools to actually deliver the same thing. And I'm convinced now that perhaps there is not so much, there is no need to actually change the physical sense. You know, you can adapt technology. I can, you know, if we have time, I can demonstrate to you, like with a free tool, all three, 200 us in this, in this room, we can still interact and we can still engage. I think mobile is the way forward. And in my training, I do that, you know. So I have, in ACAP, we have a training called Interactive Lecture, where we, we, we train lecturers how to, you know, how to engage students using various technology. Dato, you want to add any to this on the learning space? Uh, no, maybe just to add, to say that, you know, even workspaces right now, because continuous learning, so workspaces also are turning into learning spaces. Mm. And uh, it is all about, and, you know, and it, it has to be a natural thing. And uh, learning is now done through collaborative, collaborative learning. So the, the short answer would be, I, I, I would, what I'm seeing is that as long as you provide, you use technology, and you use the physical space to be able to allow them to be in a collaborative uh, setting. You know, I, I don't know about the pedagogy because I'm, you know, that is that is uh, that is not my area of expertise. But uh, what I'm seeing, if you look at, um, you know, companies like Google, how many of you have been to Google Office in Malaysia? I think we should arrange for some of the, you know, if, if I'm, I'm offering, if you want to, we can arrange a delegation to go to Google Office, and there are a few other Malaysian startups that are also now embracing iFlix Office, for instance, you know, I mean, there's about open door, you know, and you know that there is this correlation between ping pong tables and how much VC money goes into the ecosystem. So apparently, the more VC money, the more ping pong tables are being, uh, are being, uh, are being purchased. So, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Dato Yasmin. I think I uh, can take uh, another uh, one final question before I will get our panelists to summarize and conclude. Yeah, please at the back. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kong from Help University. I think there's a need for a mindset change in leadership of higher education if we are ever going to make the breakthroughs. You know. Right now, there are so many rules and regulations which we have to comply with. And it actually constrains a lot of higher education providers in this country. Just last week, I had a meeting with my staff and they asked for part-time staff to print 100 files of foreign students because we are due for an inspection. I said, I have to, why should I pay someone to print out information which is already there? If the inspectors come, all we need to do is say, which file do you want to look at? We will print out for you. But my staff said, no, we got an instruction that 100,000 files must be ready and they can choose whichever ones they want to print. So there are these rules and regulations which actually constrains a lot of the operators and higher education providers. So we need to really have to revolutionize the mindsets because we have digital copies of everything. Why do we need to print hard copies? 
why do we need to waste manpower as well as the physical resources in terms of paper production and so on. So there are a lot of constraints, you know, like Dr. Amin says, oh, we have to re rethink learning. But unless we fulfill the hours of teaching and lecturing, we are in violation of some rules and regulations. When we used to partner foreign universities, we used to tell them, oh, these are the hours that we have to lecture you know, for each subject. And they say, why are you over-teaching? You are spoon-feeding and you are over-teaching them. We don't do that in our, our home country. But unfortunately, we have to say, we have to do it because otherwise we won't fulfill the teaching hours that are prescribed by the authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, that's a very, very uh, good point that especially I think the top uh, management of the universities need to ponder. Uh, I don't know whether uh, our panelists here like to say something. Yeah, maybe a short one. Yeah, I agree with you that we should go green, that you know, we should, uh, I think MQA is going towards that. By the way, we have recommended, uh, uh, MIPTA has actually come out with a, a, a guideline. I headed the community e-learning guidelines. What is MIPTA? Huh? What is MIPTA? Maybe oh, MIPTA. <laughs> MIPTA is the Majlis e, uh, Penyelaras e Pembelajaran IPT in Malaysia. So we, we came out with a guideline on uh, e-learning for uh, higher education institutions. And we recommended, in fact, I spoke to all the uh, MQA officers that when you go auditing, you know, you should ex also accept uh, engagement as also a part of attendance. Now, we, we, attendance, we have to go like tick, 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 tick. But when people go digital, actually, the, uh, any, any, any digital system will, will be able to capture the fact that the, the students answer a question, he is present. You know, and that is perhaps more important that you know, he is engaged with the content uh, in comparison to being in the classroom for 30 minutes and you know, then mine is switched off. You know? So, so why, why bother? Uh, going through you know, the evidence of attendance and not uh, accepting something, uh, the social presence in. So we have got these guidelines. Maybe you can just Google e-learning guidelines for uh, Malaysians higher education institutions. It's already there, but it's how we practice and, and, and you know, use it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dato Amin. Dato Yasmin? Okay. Uh, I think I cannot take more questions now because time is uh, very limited. Um, and I, I'm sure our panelists here uh, would like to say more. You know, we can see when Dato Am Amin uh, speak, he's really in his element, and also Dato Yasmin, and both of them I know are very, very excellent uh, speakers. Um, because uh, now we are coming to the end of this uh, panel discussion, maybe I'd like to ask very briefly, about two minutes, each of the panelists to conclude, to summarize and, and conclude you know, the main points that you like to drive the message to the audience, with the take-home message, please. Uh, that's I mean. Okay, I, I think uh, if you want to remain relevant in today's uh, education, 21st century education, we need to bring all our professors, or all our educators on board to re rethink teaching and redesign learning. How do we assist them? We need to retrain, we need to retool, and there's two ways of doing things. One is, you know, the, the push and the pull. At the moment, our training our, our, you know, is done by pulling them to, to sessions. So how many people can we train in one session? So I think we need, to, we need to use different strategies. We can push the information. So I'm now offering to uh, all of you VCs and the uh, top management, I'm pushing my MOOC to all educators, professors in the world. It's available for free. You can get your professors to uh, register for free. It is a self-paced mode. And so far, I've got many who have graduated and they have been transformed. So I'm offering, uh, you know, you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can get your, it's free of charge. But otherwise, you know, perhaps we can do more in-house training. So thank you very much. Thank you. I, I rarely can speak in two minutes, but I'll try. Um, I think there's enough, obviously there's enough thought leadership. There is enough um, opportunity for the change to actually happen in Malaysia. Um, and um, so that is one. Secondly is that I have seen the kids, I've seen our kids in the schools, I've seen our kids when they are given the opportunity to be, 
to be part of this new world and given the opportunity for them to really soar, for them to really apply their thinking and not be confined in the traditional methods of how they're being taught and if they're given the opportunity to learn the way they want to learn. I've seen the impact both in schools and in some pockets of, uh, of, of initiatives in the university. So I'm convinced that we have the latent talent to be able to be successful in the digital economy. So the, and, and, the, and the fact that digital economy, it is so important. The country must be able. We had a 20-year lead. Uh, you know, head start in this through the multimedia super corridor. But you know, despite the 20 year, we are still on the catch up mode. It's almost like a, like a new starting point, a new starting block as far as I'm concerned. The sense, the sense of urgency. And I've, I, in all of my talks, there are two things that have to happen. We can make many initiatives, we can do a lot of programs, but two things need to happen. Number one, connectivity. Number two is talent. So with that, I'm appealing <laughs> to those people in this room, especially to the people who are sitting in the Senate, please embrace this change. You just have no choice. Otherwise, you're going to bring the country to destruction. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry. That was <laughs> <laughs> That's a very emotional appeal from Dr. Yasmin. Thank you very much. So now, uh, I think uh, before, I, I think I, I have the privilege now uh, to wrap up uh, the whole session before uh, pass on to the uh, organizer. So I think we have listened to our two expert uh, panelists this morning on this topic, uh, rethinking, teaching, and redesign learning. So I think the very powerful message from uh, our discussion this morning is we need to really make a total classroom makeover. That's the word that I, I want to use, you know. Um, and of course, as part of this making the total uh, classroom makeover. Uh, we look at teaching and learning, how we can redesign uh, learning based on the you know, new way of thinking about teaching, how we strategize and using the new models of teaching and, and so on. But as part of, of that, we have to look at the whole ecosystem. We cannot just address one element in the ecosystem, but we need to look at other elements. Like when we talk about technology, which is very integral into, in, in this uh, ecosystem to deliver the new way of teaching and the new way students learn. So, but uh, Dr. Amin has uh, stressed that technology cannot replace teachers. Teachers are still indispensable. Teachers are irreplaceable. And because technology is there, the internet is there as a huge repository of information and knowledge. So we need to change the mindset. Educators need to change the mindset. We need to unpack our curriculum so that now we are not just giving content because content is there for the students to tap uh, from the internet. But we need to go to the classroom now and maybe we make the 50 minutes classroom in a way that students will really actively involve. So that's what active learning or active classroom is about. We get the students to do. We get the students to think. We get the students to participate, we get the students to collaborate. So it's all about doing. So I think um, with that, I think, uh, yeah, the last point maybe i just like to highlight here, the concept of, of learning on demand. Because again, you know, everything is in the cloud. So, you know, the students have the mobile device, the smartphone. We need to utilize this, the most powerful, you know, we, we, uh, the students have in their hand one of the very powerful computer, you know, ever, uh, invented in the form of smartphone. So how do our educators take advantage of this and leverage on this? And last but not least, what, so what, and now what? For centuries, we go to the classroom and tell the students the what. So I think we need to now ask the question, so what at the end, and now what? So this is where the students now are able to apply their knowledge in the proper context in the real world. So with that, I would like to thank our panelists, Dato Professor Dato uh, Muhammad Amin Ambi and uh, Dato uh, Yasmin Mahmud. And um, please join me to give appreciation, a big round of applause to our <laughs> panelists. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Abdul Karim, and our panelists of the day, Professor Datuk Dr. Ami Nb and Datuk Yasmin Binti Mahmud, for the fruitful discussion.
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Now we would like to invite the Honorable Datuk Sri Idris Bin Yusof, Minister of Higher Education, to deliver his words. Please welcome Datuk Sri. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm very good morning, still morning. Already waiting for the announcement, I guess. Quite a very jittery here. Um, <coughs> Mary, Jesu, and PG, and all the rest. Uh, it's indeed. Uh, I, I remember in the beginning of my stay in this ministry, I said, we are going to be irrelevant unless we change. And I keep on repeating myself. As we move, move along, and uh, as we were designing our blueprint, uh, there was a strong message for us to really change. And uh, knowing very well the so-called the fourth industrial revolution, whatever you want to call it, uh, the technology is changing us like nobody's business. It's exponential. If you ask uh, what's the rate of change in technology, people then don't say 10, 20, or 30 percent is exponential. Business is uh, changing the technology. The rich are people who are billionaires, are people who are Alibaba, uh, not Alibaba, the guy. Uh, the, the, the business and Uber, as what's being said, are changing to the changes in technology. Of course, we have to change. Uh, you're right uh, that we are not changing as fast as we should. That's the reason we are here today. Because I want the academicians who think they know everything, so to say that again, as I mean to repeat, that we have to change. The learners are different now. So uh, technology is there for us to, to conduct our classes. And uh, that's a special reason in this third uh, forum, future university forum, we, hold this, we have this young good guy. Uh, uh, I mean, give him a good hand for winning the award. Did you say that, Karim? He won the award. He won the Educators Award. Uh, one of the two uh, guys in the world who won the award. And uh, of course, we have this uh, that Yasmin also, uh, who knows technology too well, you know, uh, to be uh, telling us how things should change. So that's a challenge that you are facing. And uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, Dr. Yasmin and Dr. Casey who are saying the same thing. Senate also had to change. Of course, we also in the, education, in the ministry has to change the way we do things. We don't need piles of papers and we can get it access to. I mean, I was, I was, I'm upset to hear that, but uh, that's how things are still happening in the ministry because, again, as being said, the mindset has yet to change. That's the reason, if you see on the board, my new, uh, new Year address saying that we have to change ourselves. That's why I keep talking about uh, gamification. I was short of telling about which your reality, how we should learn. Of course, I, did, I didn't mention so much about YouTube and your Twitters. Uh, but of course, things have to change. Assessment has to change. That's the reason why we are having two U to I, which has nothing to do with you and nothing to do with I. In fact, we are embarking in the world. That's why we're coming out with integrated CGPA which are the first in the world to do that. Knowing that what you learn is not everything. But we also have to understand that lecturing is also not everything. It's a doing part, as being said by Amin just now. We know it very well. But we keep on doing the same thing as what you used to do before because we are so comfortable in doing that. You go to class because you want to lecture. Not you go to class because you want the students to participate. We don't do that anymore. So these are the changing world. So... Uh, I'm glad. Thank you for coming today. I see big guns are here today. I hope this will change the ministry. <laughs> and I also pray that I don't have to change. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Sri. As a token of appreciation to all the panelists and moderators of the day, once again, we would like to invite the Honorable Dr. Sri De Bin Yusuf, Minister of Higher Education, to present mementos to all the panelists and moderators. We would also like to invite the Honorable Datuk Maria Kanchin, Datuk Sri Insinyur Dr. Zaini Bin Ujang, and also Datuk Professor Dr. Asma Bint Ismail for the mentor presentation ceremony.
to begin with the momentous presentation, please welcome Professor Dato Dr. Amin Bin Ambi, Director Center for Teaching and Learning Technologies, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Dr. Yasmin Bintin Mahmud, Chief Executive Officer, Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation. And Professor Dr. Abdul Karim Bin Alias, Director Center for Development of Academy Excellence and Student Development, University Science Malaysia. We would like to invite the Tosri and all the honorable guests together with the panelists and moderator to be on the stage for the photography session. Thank you, Datuk Sri, and all the honourable guests. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the forum for today. Once again, join me in thanking our honourable panelists and moderator for their very insightful and informative discussion. Thank you, Datuk Sri, Minister of Higher Education, and everyone for your presence until then. We will meet again. Thank you very much.